We're going to begin our panel discussion, so you can move closer if you'd like. That's not, that's not this, that's the last speaker. <laughs> the last speaker. <laughs> wow, it's like spooky. Call all your friends. Yeah. Get that impression. Start. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm Bruce Allardyce, Managing Director of Ping Chong and Company, uh, and a member of the Board of Directors of the Network of Ensemble Theaters. Uh, looking forward to uh, talking to you today about some of the work that all of us here have been doing. Um, each of these artists and uh, academics, scholars, have had uh, relationships with Ping Chong Company over the years, um, as well as incredible work that they've done on their own, and we're going to try to get to all of that. First, I want to just say this has been an incredible symposium weekend here, um, and I want to thank the New School for hosting this. Amazing, amazing, um, and uh, so. Uh, let's get started. Um, so the starting on the far side is my dear friend and colleague, Michael Rode, uh, who you've heard for enough, yeah, enough about. <laughs> enough about. This is Stephen Hitt, who is the managing director of LaGuardia Performing Arts Center at LaGuardia Community College in Long Island City, Queens, uh, an incredible uh, part of the CUNY system uh, uh, where we've worked with him on, uh, we worked on one project uh, uh, five or six years ago and are working, the Ping Chong Company is working on a new project which we'll talk about. This is Yuko uh, Korahashi who is a professor at Kent State University uh, and was one of our, was our academic partner on the Blindness Project, which Michael co-wrote and co-directed with Ping Chong. Uh, and she is also one of, she's also a, a leading scholar on the Ping Chong Company's Undesirable Elements series. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Ping Chong and Company. So uh, Ping Chong Company is 42 years old, was uh, founded by uh, Ping Chong. We're an ensemble of, uh, we create work uh, in an ensemble process. Um, Ping is one of our, is our principal artist, was our founder principal artist. We also work, uh, Sarah, we also support the work of Sarah Zatzimai, uh company, uh, Talvin Wilkes, uh, at, in the past with Michael Rode uh, and others. Uh, the, um, I would say the, um, the thing that most defines Ping Chong Company uh, organizationally is that we do not have a theater of our own. Therefore, everything that we do at one level or another is a partnership or is involves uh, making a connection with another organization. The, um, and the work that we do uh, is incredibly varied. And it, there's two major streams of activity the uh, creation of interdisciplinary performance works, and these can range from uh, large-scale puppetry works 
to uh, dance performances, to uh, 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 multimedia productions. Uh, and then the other is our community engaged social justice oral history project, The Undesirable Elements, which is where we go into a community, we work with those, we identify people in that community, broadly speaking, who, um, and interview them and put their stories on stage told by them themselves. And we've done this uh, for places uh, in uh, productions all over the country. So one of the things that we do, what this is, means, and I was very inspired by Liz Lerman to talk about going from this to this. Um, we've been in this state for a very long time because on any given year, we could be working at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival or, and, at, and at La Mama and at uh, a university, Syracuse University, for instance, and at a community center in the Bronx. And we try to bring the same artistic rigor uh, to each of those organizations with the understanding that the resources, frankly, are very, and the, uh, are frankly very, very different. But the artistic intention, um, uh, the artistry, we try to bring to each of those projects. So, um, I want to talk, show you some examples of some, perform, of some productions that we've done that have roots in, that have been done through, the, through working with universities. Um, and the first one I'm going to start with uh, is, uh, is Truth and Beauty, um, which actually was Michael Rode was uh, one of the principal instigators of that project. And um, we met him uh, when Ping was uh, teaching a workshop at, uh, at the Co Festival. And Michael and Jeff Rose, another actor, presented 10 minutes of material, and Ping was inspired to ask them if they'd be interested in continuing to develop that work. Can I just say so short? Just like, so we take a workshop with Ping Chong, and at the end of the week, he comes up to us and says, I'm really interested in what you did. Would you like to work more with me on the material? <laughs> we were like, sure. <laughs> yes, please. And then figured we'd never hear from him again. And, but we did hear from Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, but, I, but we, we, you heard from me, but um, Michael was with Virginia Tech. And, um, uh, and they invited us in and really made the, the production happen. So um, Truth and Beauty is, uh, is really about, about an investigation of kind of the dark soul of, American, of America, influenced by media, advertising, gun violence, and tracking through this story is a, uh, it was sort of inspired by uh, Columbine, happened prior to the horrific gun violence that's beset the Virginia Tech uh, uh, a couple times since. Um, and um, the piece also, uh, we made the piece at Virginia Tech and but with designers from Virginia Tech, Randy Ward. Um, Randy Ward became one of our principal designers moving forward, doing productions with us all over the world, really. Um, so let's move on to Blindness. And Blindness was a piece that we made at, the, uh, at Kent State University. And it was a kind of... Um, uh, there's a funny kind of story about that. There was, we were the first uh, of the Roe Green visiting fellows, a visiting director at, uh, at Kent State University. And Roe, uh, um, who we didn't know at all, but apparently she heard Ping talk 
at, at some place at Seattle Rep or something, and they asked, you know, well, thank you for this wonderful, you know, bestowing this directing chair. Um, who would you like? And said, well, I don't know any directors, but there was this nice man I saw in Seattle. <laughs> So they invited us, and one of the things I want to say about when we, when the Ping Chong Company works in universities, it's very important for Ping that we work in uh, stories that have resonate academically, they resonate historically, that they're educational in some way, and um, uh, blindness is uh, about the. Um, colonial exploitation of the Belgian Congos at the hands of King Leopold, and it combined elements from uh, it combined elements from uh, Heart of Darkness, which was performed on a puppetry track, shadow puppetries, and live actors. Uh, we brought in for that production, which Michael was involved with. You can see him there with the funny mustache. Um, we brought in, I think. Four <laughs> professional actors, some from Sojourn, some from uh, that we knew, and uh, again, Randy Ward from Virginia Tech came in to do the design, and worked with the um, uh, with Kent State actors and student designers, and I think that at the um, and it was a large show. Um, I think that over fifty. These are two performers uh, who were at uh, Kent State. Um, uh, I think that when we, uh, I think that over 60 people in the university community worked on that production. Um, and then we were able to, um, through circumstances, uh, allowed us to bring that entire production from Kent, Kent State to La Mama and perform that for three weeks at the, in the Ellen Stewart Theater, uh, which was an experience that was, well, transformative for these young kids from Ohio. So um, the next project that I'd like to uh, talk about is Cocktail. And Cocktail was, uh, that piece is uh, about the international, about international pharmaceutical industry and the AIDS and, the, and AIDS treatment. Uh, it was about a, uh, a Thai chemist, uh, a person that we met, interviewed, uh, Dr. Kishantu, who um, developed a, uh, a low-cost AIDS treatment regimen uh, for uh, and in gratitude for her work was kicked out of, essentially kicked out of Thailand, um, and is now making doing this work around. And we made this piece at uh, at Louisiana State University. We brought some actors from New York, and again worked with lot with many many students um, on that production at multiple levels and work with both student designers and staff designers at uh, Louisiana State. And one of the things that I've learned from working in universities, one of the ways to get them engaged in your work is to create uh, creative experiences for the, for the professional staff because that's what we're all looking for and what sometimes rarely happens. Sometimes it seems like it's not ha that doesn't happen in university situations. So uh, that was Cocktail, which we did at the Swine Palace. Um, this is a very different kind of engagement with the university. The um, Cry for Peace is a performance from the Undesirable Elements series. Uh, we were asked by, uh, by the Office of Arts Engagement at uh, Syracuse University uh, if we would work with the community of, uh, of Congolese refugees who had been relocated to Syracuse. These were people who came from East Congo. They had been uh, 
all experienced the terrible ongoing violence war there, mineral war there, and they, um, they were from different ethnic groups and tribes. Some of them had been, cons had been child soldiers. Some had been uh, conscripted into sexual servitude to the child armies. And in Syracuse, they were trying to heal their community. And it was a, a complete honor to be asked to come and work with this group to create a, a piece that they could use and take to their community and to other Congolese communities around the country. And I have to give a, a shout out to uh, Nancy Cantor, uh, who was the, uh, 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 the dean or president of, uh, of uh, Syracuse University for making that possible um, as part. And her vision of that university at that time was to connect the experience of the student to the community, to the world. And she saw that in this project, the possibility of doing that, this piece we also took ultimately to Georgetown University and to, um, and to La Mama for performances. And they are performing this piece still on their own. And if any of you know Georgetown, uh, University and Syracuse, you know that they're rivals, they're basketball rivals. <laughs> so when we brought the piece to Georgetown, that was actually a harder negotiation with the <laughs> alumni offices and to get that project done than anything we had to do with the Congolese <laughs> community. <laughs> so, um, but so that piece, which this piece, uh, no, the, the Congolese piece, uh, we developed that over three years, uh, um, being in, in multiple trips to uh, Syracuse. So now, Inside Out, Inside Out is um, uh, our Undesirable Elements production um, featuring the stories of people with a variety of disabilities. And we, um, we actually, it, we started that production and went to an organization called VSA Arts, Disability Arts, and asked to, to work with them to develop this because Ping was interested in this subject. Um, and after a long time, they said, yes, you should do it, but we need it to happen uh, at the Kennedy Center uh, first performance at the Kennedy Center, and uh, you have to do it, make it in New York. Um, and my f rehearsals facilities are not uh, accessible. I'm ashamed to say they're not really accessible. So, um, uh, which began us looking for rehearsal uh, facilities and meeting Stephen Hitt, who came and made LaGuardia. Uh, community college uh, available to us to rehearse the show. It was an ideal situation because it was uh, accessible and it was familiar to Accessoride and all of the various other things. Um, let's go on. So then this is a project that we're working on now with Stephen. Uh, flash forward a number of years, and we're working with Stephen on a project called Beyond Sacred, which will be looking at the differences of culture and ex historical experience of Muslims in New York City. And these are images that are from our recruiting effort, which is underway now, which we're doing in a multiple ways including outreach to community groups. And uh, we were in Flushing Town Hall last week at LaGuardia. And this piece will uh, premiere in April 2015. Uh, it's not cast yet. So if you know anyone, please, that are interested, Contact us on the information's on our website. So, and then 
then I just wanted to just show you something that we're working on now, which actually premieres Friday at <laughs> University of Maryland, which is a piece of this, that Ping's doing that's really inspired. It's called Kaleidoscope Adventures in Pre- and Post-Racial America. And it's inspired by the events, by, their, by our anger over the events of uh, the murder of uh, Trayvon Martin and the violence directed at, at African Americans, Native Americans, Chinese Americans, gay, all of us. Um, and he and Talvin Wilkes are working with the students there to, um, they, what they've done is gathered texts, archival texts, from the kind of long history of race in America, which we are, they're collaging. Some of them are being done verbatim. Some of them are being used as launching points for improvisations. Some are being, they've written some material inspired by their own things. And this piece is all working with the uh, designer, with, with student designers. And uh, I have to say we're just like not out by these young designers. They're doing an incredible job. These are early drafts. Um, and that's the, um, the uh, one of the dilemmas we had with this project was we didn't actually, Ping and Talvin didn't write the script until the summer. Uh, but they already needed to be in production. The shop needed to be building. So the first part was an engagement really with design. So those are some theater productions that we have done. In terms of universities, we also have an ongoing training program which brings us to uh, uh, universities regularly. Later this year, we're going to be at uh, Kennesaw State College in Georgia, and an ongoing relation with uh, Amherst College, which uh, uh, provides us kind of uh, space for our uh, uh, training, some training labs that we do um, annually or semi-annually. So that's pretty much how we have done. Now, the, the question is, you know, really why does the Pink Chong Company want to work in universities? And uh, there are multiple reasons. Uh, one is, um, uh, one is, to be totally candid, is financial, uh, that there's resources available to support us. Uh, that, that is greatly appreciated. Um, but the other is also that Ping finds that the, su there are subjects that he can't explore in the, really in the American theater uh, outside of the academic situation. Uh, uh, like about the Belgian, the exploitation of the Belgian Congo, like about the AIDS uh, drug, pharmaceutical industry and AIDS. So there's a kind of, and there's resources to be able to kind of create productions at a certain kind of scale that um, isn't always available or it's hard for us to achieve on our own. So that's the kind of five, ten minute Ping Chong story. And I think um, he wants you to know that Peck is going well. <laughs> Did he just eat? <laughs> <laughs> it's going I'll good. call him in I'll call him when we get off stage. Yeah. <laughs> that usually means I should call. <laughs> no, no. He said it's really going well. <laughs> no. That means he's having a good time. It doesn't necessarily mean the show's going anywhere. Yeah, right? he's had a great time. At the, yeah. at, 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 he's had a great time on this project. I will say that. Um, so I'm going to like uh, introduce now uh, Yuko Korohashi, and she actually, and I didn't know this until this panel started. She made a documentary on the blindness project, and we're going to show you an excerpt of it. But you start. Um, thank you so much for inviting me and us to this wonderful symposium. I just can't uh, find words and just to, I was stunned by the artist's dedication and contributions to 
develop the bridges, many bridges between them, other artists and universities and other educational venues. And uh, we need to continue this kind of dialogue. That said, um, when uh, Bruce invited me to this panel, well, sure, 10 years ago, sure, but I have a, um, this documentary film I made. Would you like to see it, you know? <laughs> so then, then I didn't know they would like it. And then one of the reasons I never shared this uh, beyond the Kent State University and my students was a little bit shy about my documentary film school. I never made a film and I was no idea what I was doing. I was a dramaturg, I was a researcher, I was a teacher, and I'm still a teacher at Kent State. So I was helping students, helping Michael Pin, Bruce, and that was my primary role. While doing that, well, maybe someday I will make a film. That's what I have. So I uh, had some challenges. I didn't plan to make a documentary film correctly, so I didn't have enough footages. Um, for some scenes, so kind of compensated by using rehearsal or the audition scenes, kind of, I kind of compensated that way. But amazingly, it captured how we got there from the beginning to the result. And especially the students, uh, um, I think that the responses were very, very uh, variable to be documented. And uh, I, my film is actually 19 minutes. So Bruce asked me, could you re-edit it to down to maybe four to five? Sure, and I did it um, three days ago. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm going to show you. The Irresistible Light of Encounter was a collaborative theater production that Ping Chong and his co-director Michael Rode created with the Kent State University School of Theater and Dance in March and April of 2004. The production used both faculty and students from Kent State's theater program, along with designers and actors that Ping Chong brought with him. The piece contained both a shadow puppet play of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness and actors performing a play based on the colonization of the Congo by Leopold II of Belgium. Prior to the rehearsal period, the cast and crew were given a chance to conduct their own research and to discuss the play and its historical complexity in a two-month workshop conducted by Professors Charles Ritchie and Yuko Kurohashi to investigate the historical background to blindness. Professor Chris McVeigh from the Pan-African Department also participated in the workshop and provided the students with insight into Afrocentric and Eurocentric views of the world. The script for the play was not completed when rehearsals began. It was created as the actors rehearsed. The stage manager, Courtney Golden, videotaped improvisational scenes during the rehearsals and then transcribed the materials. The movements used by the actors playing the force publique were also not choreographed prior to the beginning of rehearsals, were created based on movements developed by the students during the rehearsal process. And that's actually like one of the best parts mm -hmm. of this whole process is that um, we all created these things and they kind of got whatever they liked and so half of the rifle piece is stuff that I created and that's on stage now and that's so, I mean, neat to watch and so artistically fulfilling. In Forceful Week, it was very hard for me to um, get out of the ballet uh, mode mm -hmm. and stop being pretty. I think the difficult parts for me as well as for a lot of other people were learning things and then having them be cut and learning things and having them be cut and watch your character get smaller and smaller and smaller. I think one of the newest discoveries is that um, you can go into a project with great minds without a script mm -hmm. and with keeping the confidence and, and the focus together. So creating the, the script, I was really scared at the beginning because I thought it was just going to be okay, uh, you're on stage now, go ahead, improv, do whatever. I learned that I need to work with an actual script. It's a different process that it has.
I'm uh, one of the chorus members, you know, Force Public, and I also am uh, one of the Boon Raku puppeteers. I think the biggest challenge was the fact that there was no script, and uh, we had to go up there and do a lot of improv. My improv is okay, but not excellent, so the improv part of it, like playing characters that we didn't have any script for, but just based off the books that we read. When this production like started, when I first found out I was going to be in it, I was terrified, and Michael was like, you know, Grace, like, what's wrong? And I kind of told him, I'm like, no. He's like, Grace, you need to leave that thought behind right now. And I'm, I'm asking you to leave that here today. Uh, it's not so much a psychological approach to character in rehearsal that happens my own work. It's more about uh, movement patterns and rhythm of a character in the context of a scene, and then also layer on the context of the play. Kim Cox, props master, explains how she created a tree of mutilated hands and a whipped African for the floats. These are fake hands that were purchased at Mr. Jones. And some of them actually had sleeves on them when we ripped them off and put the insides, the batting oh in the inside, God. to make the kind of gooey, nasty part. I'm trying to harden it now so we can paint it. And one's the, the, the smaller guy right now. We're using wood for the arms and legs. And this articulates, this goes, and mm. actually kind of gives the impression of whipping. On the back wall, the following words are projected. The tragedy of the Congo is its embarrassment of riches. Coltan is a mineral used in cell phones and laptops around the world. The Congo is rich in coltan. War and poverty keep today's Congo in chaos. Chaos keeps coltan cheap on the world market. At this very moment, coltan is making its way from the Congo to your home and mine. Incredible, what an incredible film. <laughs> so, um, just to, before I'm turning my, ta um, my mic over to my co presenter today, is um, we, have, we are so fortunate to have this donor supporter, uh, Miss Ro Green. And my name is Stephen Hitt. I am the artistic director of LaGuardia Performing Arts Center at LaGuardia. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, and so that enabled us to work with different uh, directors, and but just once a year, and I think this is going to continue um, another 10 years and more. I, um, from this were, um, conference symposium, I learned the importance of doing the, um, the, the service as an ambassador in a small you know, capacity at the small level, not, it's, uh, not going to be maybe the um, big director of the series, I can invite the people like you, but I can certainly talk to the different area heads or area faculty members and artists in my department to work or come up with some idea to do some small scale workshop. Blindness was big. So it's coming up with this scale project is a, a lot of, you know, needs a lot of preparation. However, if each of us becomes an ambassador to make some smaller workshops and project happen to build and develop a bridge between universities and theater companies that will be just, uh, um, that will help the next generation, current generations, and uh, um, all kinds of artists and students in the future. Thank you.
So um, one thing I, I, I think that was so interesting and so important about the blindness uh, uh, project was the academic component that was built in, in advance um, so that there was a, a real grounding uh, on the material that we would explore on stage there was a real grounding of that in the in the academic community uh, ahead of time. Uh, Professor Kurahashi took was one of the leaders of that. I know that Michael and Ping also participated in that, um, and that class was also became, I believe, became part of the funding structure for the production, which was uh, had uh, provided uh, academic credit, which. Academic credit has monetary uh, meaning in, in, in universities, and so that they were able to, to justify putting more resources, because as, as she says, that it was a very large production, but that the students came out of this work with um, particular academic credit and for participating in this project. Michael, do you want to add anything about that experience? No, Other I, than I, that you wrote it in the morning and rehearsed it at night. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I think you. I think you covered it. I mean, I, 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 I would say, I guess one thing I would add is, um, I'd highlight what an important project I think it was for Ping, that that it was a, a subject matter that he'd been wanting to tackle at a large scale for years, and it was really hard to find the resources and context totally. I think to tackle it at that scale, and the relationship with Kent State allowed him to um, do the research, devote the time. Uh, spend the time on the ground, find a way to get it to La Mama, his frequent home here. So, I mean, I know he describes it as a, as a transformative project for him as an artist in terms of content and the kind of work he was doing at universities. So I just would add how lucky we were yeah, to have totally. the opportunity. Totally. So, um, Stephen. Hi. So, <laughs> <laughs> do you want to introduce uh, your... Uh, uh, the video? Sure. Um, I think even before I go into the video, I'll tell you a little bit about the Performing Arts Center itself and how we work. Uh, a few years ago, I was fortunate enough to stumble upon the best job in the world and came into uh, a, a college that was looking for a director for Performing Arts Center. And so I run the professional theater within a college, within a university. And uh, the first thing that I did was come in there and, she, and the president of the college said, I want you to create a nationally known performing arts center. And I, you have my full support, you just don't have any money. <laughs> mm -hmm. The incredible gift that we do have though is I have a staff that's paid for through the City University of New York and space that's paid for by the City University of New York. So I have amazing resources around there but not being able to hire artists in, the first thing I did was work with my assistant director who came out of the Lincoln Center Director's Lab. I came out of the Broadway world and the concert dance world and we all started calling our friends and saying, hey, I've got a theater, do you want to play? And so we started a program where works were created and made there on our campus and then moved out into the world. And that's when we first started working with Ping and um, he came in and did inside, inside outside. So did, yes, out. In, inside out. Um, and so that was an amazing thing because the Gordia Performing Arts Center didn't have a name, the area didn't have a name, but we were able to um, work with artists that did have names, put them in, and give them the space to create work, and then our name traveled to the Kennedy Center to start moving our name out into the world as well. So it really was a marketing piece as much as it was a way to start uh, making work and developing it around there. And it suddenly realized that this was an important mission for us within uh, the city of New York because the most expensive part of making art in the city of New York is the space to do it. Uh, the, the city of New York University um, CUNY owns more theaters than the Schubert's and uh, there are 24 campuses each of us have one two three theaters on each campus 
So it, there's a lot of space there. And we also, each of us have our own egos. So we can't all work together <laughs> in doing this. But I believe for myself that I, I was a Broadway performer. I was very lucky. I made a lot of money doing that. It was something that I burned out on um, because it didn't get me a chance to have my own voice. And more and more of what I watch happening in the Broadway world right now is star vehicles that are very, very expensive are, and revivals of old works because people can't afford to take chances on new work that's being written and made right here in the city. So the off-Broadway houses are now having to do what the Broadway houses were doing when I came here 30 years ago. So I think our responsibility in the off-off-Broadway houses is to provide the space to make work. We'll invite an artist in at this point, and they might be there for two years, uh, writing a script, choreographing a piece, trying it out, coming back, workshopping it, developing it, and then we get it to the point of where we'll produce it and then try and move it. Uh, we have two right now that are, one's moving to New York Theater Workshop, another one's moving to Drama League. Uh, at the same time, I have a facility where I can make my own work. What I didn't anticipate coming in here also was a wealth of um, story within the student body of the college there. And people who had amazing stories but didn't necessarily know how to tell them. So we started working a lot with the idea of combining professional actors and organizations who had uh, the skill to tell story and working with the students who were learning how to tell their own stories and they started teaching each other. Uh, and that's part of what you'll see in this, this piece coming up here called Unpacking Home. And I think I'll show that and then we'll go from there. So my name is Stephen Hitt. I am the Artistic Director of LaGuardia Performing Arts Center at LaGuardia Community College. Theater for Social Justice is an important aspect of the Performing Arts Center. Stand up. Stretch, shake out. Good job. Take everything out. <laughs> now sit back down. Okay. Yeah. okay. Through this entire process, we're going to be transforming ourselves into volunteers. We're going to be amazing people in another six weeks when we finish this whole piece. I think art particularly theater is a powerful tool for change in society. I started off as a Broadway musical theater dancer to entertain people in a way to help them escape. And then I think I became more socially aware of issues that were going on in the world and how powerful theater could be used to tell a story. That's how street made, you know? You gotta do what you gotta do. The picture in theater is still, because we're still doing the shows from the 1950s, it's still that 1950s America. So it's the responsibility, I think, of those of us who are running the awful Broadway theaters and training the students to find work, make work, reflects the reality of what our population is. And also teach people skills that will help them make their own work and take their own voice out into the community and out into the world. Coming to Covenant House and helping others find their sense of home. So if I can do that with a piece like this, like Unpacking Home, and then start a conversation that goes beyond that, it's a great gift that we can provide to the city. I think... Can we do it twice as loud? I need twice the volume, okay? They're not hearing you over here. Song on a larger scale, and you're having an emotional response to it. Uh, 
My name is Stephen Hitt. <laughs> Stephen, could you tell us a little bit about the uh, uh, about the student body uh, of at LaGuardia and also the uh, community that uh, uh, LaGuardia is in? Sure. Uh, we are probably in the most diverse community in the entire world, and. Uh, our student body is made up of students from 190 different countries. They speak 119 different languages. Uh, and that's not just one or two people, but it's, it's like walking through the halls of the UN. Uh, when I first got there, it was just amazing with this cacophony of sound and language that was floating around me. And to our students, it's just the people they hang out with, they grew up with. Uh, many of them are immigrants. A uh, majority of them are first generation, uh, going to college, uh, even completing a high school GED, getting, uh, getting a high school degree and coming to college there. If any of you are familiar with Queens, the seven train that runs through there, that's our student body. Uh, we have 18,000 full-time students. We have 50,000 adult and continuing education students going through there. Uh, we just started a theater major two years ago and have just a little over 100 majors there. Uh, and I, I produce, along with the professional shows, the student shows, and work very closely with the academic side and, and then teach as an adjunct on the academic side as well as being the director of the Performing Arts Center. Uh, so I'm around a bunch of kids that give me energy and give me life every single day uh, because they inspire me, because their stories are amazing. When we did the, this project, Unpacking Home, and we started talking about uh, homelessness, the idea was that we would get a, a group of students together uh, because part of the mission of the college is to be, create socially responsible students and citizens of the world. And so we thought we're going to have students volunteering in shelter systems, working in the shelters, and then devising work based on their experiences around that. Our very first meeting, one a student after another started saying, well, when my family was in the system, when my family was homeless, when I didn't, and you started discovering the richness of their own stories that were right there in the room with them, combined with, I had four actors who had recently graduated from NYU, who had impeccable skills, but were sitting there saying, why do you have me here? <laughs> what am I supposed to do? But as they started growing and learning and teaching each other, it was an amazing uh, thing to watch. It was quite beautiful. And four of us facilitated this dialogue. I would say there was, no, there was not one director on the project itself. Uh, we took the students through a simulated homeless uh, situation, um, not knowing at the time when we put this together how many of them had actually lived that already. Uh, but it was a way of getting them involved in it to the point of we were down by Trinity Church Wall Street helped host this for us in, in their facility. And so we were outside the church, which is right by the World Trade Centers with a lot of tourists going through. And one of the first things I remember is having students out on the street and they were panhandling and they were singing. And I, this one man was walking by and looked at his, his wife and said, God, there are a lot of homeless kids around here. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it, was a, it was a fascinating uh, project, and it's a model that we want to keep working with. Uh, we're spending this year now looking at Muslim identity. We have a large uh, Muslim population within the, the, the college itself and within the community. Uh, 
finding them and getting them on stage to tell story uh, has been an interesting um, adventure so far. Uh, we're working right now with uh, Max with uh, Theater of the Press NYC uh, to develop a community forum that'll be launching in this next week and we're taking the dialogue out into the community to talk about it, bringing it back onto campus into uh, academic panels and then looking at it through another performing arts piece. So we're using the lens of the performing arts as a way to have a discussion about Muslim identity and the stereotypes that we carry about the people who practice Islam. Uh, so it's, it's so far been a fascinating year and we'll culminate the season with Ping's work coming up. Uh, yes, and I just want to say that um, the uh, um, Beyond Sacred project is uh, the whole project at LaGuardia is being supported by the uh, Building Bridges program of the, of, uh, through arts presenters, uh, uh, through, with the support of the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. And the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. And the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. And the two of them are yes, great. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you to all of them. But I think it's an incredible testament to, because anyone that worked with arts presenters would know that the, that, that represents lar or the, when they, when LaGuardia got this grant, they were competing with the largest university arts presenters in the country for this. Um, an incredible testimony to what Stephen has accomplished in how many years? Six. Six years. So I think that we should um, hear more from Michael Rode. I want to hear more from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll be really quick. Give, what do you think? Ten minutes? Because I want to make sure we get to, so I'm going to do like yeah, a thumbnail. Yeah, let's do ten and then ten? let's do some conversation. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to put this on my timer so I will make sure they don't go too long. Wow, okay. you've done this before, huh? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, so, so my company, Sojourn Theater, which I talked about a little earlier, um, has done a lot of work with universities over the years, and I just thought I would give a small snapshot of one particular project. So the context is, um, actually, I need to say before I say that, that it's, it always bears mentioning being at a panel that is in conversation with Ping Chong and company, and Ping and Bruce, uh, what an important organization Ping Chong and company has been uh, globally and nationally, and certainly here in New York, for young artists for generations, both in university settings and out of university settings, to learn about a particular kind of rigorous, adventurous art making alongside really meaningful social justice values. So I'm really lucky that I got to know Ping as a mentor and eventually a friend starting in the late 90s. But there's just many of us, I'm sure some in this room, and lots and lots out there not in this room who just owe a great deal to the work of Ping and Bruce and everyone at the organization. So I just want to make sure that gets said in this session. So thank you to Ping and Bruce. And, and so um, so uh, Sojourn Theater, um, I teach at Northwestern University. Uh, and it's really actually great to be in conversation with the project you just described, as you described uh, having the situation where you wanted to do this piece and you thought, okay, we'll go out and do volunteer work and research, but actually the students that we're working with bring in some experiences. So I, I had a very kind of funny counter experience, sort of, which was that uh, the theater department where I teach several years ago said, we're going to do a themed season next year on our main stage. We're going to do a, a season about poverty. Uh, and they'd never had a devised show on the main stage. I've been teaching there since 07, 08, um, and um, they said, oh, we'd love you to, to, to do a piece for next season. Um, and I said, oh, I, I think I might be able to do that schedule-wise, but what, what are your thoughts? And they said, well, we figured you could devise something where the students go out and talk to people, learn stuff about poverty, and then perform their stories. <laughs> and so in my head, I'm like, okay, but we're in, we're in an institution of privilege, Right, working not entirely, but majority with students who come from experiences and backgrounds of privilege. I'm not sure that that proposal is the best idea <laughs> for the main stage season for the subscription audience at this particular theater, nor sort of ethically for the student population or for lots of reasons, you know where I'm going. So I said, that doesn't sound like a great idea. Can I pitch you a different idea? 
And they said, okay. So I came back a little while later and I said, I would like to pitch an idea that as opposed to being a representation of the poverty of others, is actually inviting uh, audiences into a conversation about poverty in our communities. And the way I'd like to do that, I brought in the title, How to End Poverty in 90 Minutes with 199 People You May or May Not Know. <laughs> I think, what's the next image? Okay, <laughs> that's an image from the show itself. Um, anyway, what we did was, uh, I got the school, oh no, let's keep the, I'm gonna talk for a minute. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, I got the school to uh, say that they would commit a significant portion of the box office of every performance to basically a, a, a glass bowl of money that would sit on stage for every performance, at least $1,000 a show. And I proposed to them that the plot of the show is the audience of 200 people having to decide in 90 minutes how to attack poverty in their local community with that $1,000. And at the end of the show, that $1,000 will be spent in the way that this audience has collectively decided it should be spent. And, and that's what we did. So we did, we did 12 performances, and we gave away $12,000. Uh, but more important than, than the money, for, for me, is that we used theater to uh, activate a space of discourse. And what I'm going to do in like a minute or two right now is just describe for you the process in the university context that made that possible um, in, a, in a sort of nuts and bolts way, which was once the school uh, committed to it, uh, I cast the show with undergrad, and it was a collaboration with, with my company Sojourn, I cast the show with 18 undergraduate performers more than a year before the show was to go up, which is very unusual, at least there. Uh, normally you would cast a quarter or two ahead of time, but I said the only way this can work is if we cast early, I give summer assignments, and then I get to teach a fall course around the issues of the show, not concerned with making the piece theatrically, but we need to learn. We need to invite community experts in to become partners on the project. We need to be in conversation with them. And we need to develop the facilitation tactics that are going to allow us to create a satisfying piece of theater, a safe piece of theater, but not always a comfortable piece of theater. So fall of 2012, we, had a, the, we do quarters, not semesters. We had 10 weeks. The course was like 30 people. It was the cast. It was designers, which was a combination of grad students, faculty members, um, including, you know, hilariously, Todd Rosenthal, who some of you, Todd Rosenthal is like kind of one of the, he's like a schmancy scenic designer, like Broadway, London, all over the world, and we've been looking for a way to work together, and I can't really afford Todd. <laughs> um, but he was like, I want to do that. So Todd is like working with the students, really engaging in this material and in the design of the show alongside a collaborator, a grad student, and then company members from Sojourn are also coming in and working on it. We do the course. We partner with departments of sociology, economics, um, business, education, social change, community engagement, all these partners on campus. We also partner with shelters and social service agencies in Chicago, as well as Evanston. We have people from the city of Chicago, the city of Evanston, just all these really interesting conversations that we're hosting as a part of developing the project. And then we get to the end of the fall, and everybody feels a little more grounded in sort of at least how to have a conversation that is not a naive conversation about poverty and race and class and city and suburban and rural. And that was really, like that was, we couldn't have done the show in a responsible way without those 10 weeks. Uh, and that was just tremendously exciting. Um, oh yeah, that's Kira. So go back one slide if you could please. So this is a moment I wanted to show, so, so then we, we rehearsed it for seven weeks including tech, we put a show up. Uh, I, I wanna say though, in the rehearsal process, not only did we build the show, but two, two people, two student assistants, full-time job on the project was what we'll call audience design. Meant for four months, and this is something Sojourn does for every project, we were not gonna like market the show and hope an audience comes that was interesting, because what, what we like to say is, if a show involves dialogue within the dramaturgy of the piece, if you leave the complexity of the audience to chance, it is as if you are casting a mediocre Willie Loman. Right? You need a nuanced, sophisticated, awesome, virtuosic Willie Loman to bring the drama and humanity of that piece to life. If you have a show based on dialogue, you better have complex humanity in the room. 
Meaning, let's not have a diverse audience. Yes, let's have a complex audience that represents ideological diversity, generational diversity, life experience diversity, cultural, generate all these things. So we dedicated as much energy to a complex audience as we did to making the material. Every night of rehearsal, a portion of the acting company in the show would get sent off with the assistants, and they would spend that rehearsal online, on the phone, meeting with people. So we were building partnerships all over the area so that literally 25% of the 200 seats at every performance had to be filled with human beings that would help complexify the audience that otherwise might be a suburban North Shore or Chicago theater-going audience. And that was really important to us and was fairly successful. Uh, and as we've done the show in other places, which I'll briefly talk about, that continues. Anyway, we made the show, and it's a combination of sort of epic performative moments. And then next slide, please. This kind of moment where the audience is broken up into 10 groups of 20. And this is a, this is a 500 seat, maybe they've been to and used to the Barber Theater. It's a 500 seat uh, sort of thrust theater, but we only sat 200 people in it. And they're split in different spots around the theater so that there's a performer that is the host of each uh, group so that the show is basically like 65% performative, you're witnessing, and 35% exchange dialogical and you're participating. And the performers are literally like jumping in and out between like, I'm in a scene, I'm a monologue, I'm, I'm singing, I've got this movement thing, I'm right with you guys and we're talking right now. We have to figure this thing out. And we have five minutes to look at these five things and figure out which one feels most interesting to us and which one feels like not where we want to put our focus. So these were the five approaches that eventually the audience was voting on. And at every performance, there were organizations that had self-defined as falling under one of those approaches in the Chicago area. And when the audience finally did their vote at the end of the show, Whichever one they chose from, there was an envelope under the stage that every night had different organizations on it, and nobody knew except one assistant who did this. We would, the, an actor would pull out the envelope after the big vote. She'd say, tonight it's making opportunities, and that is, and they'd read the name of the organization. And usually people from the five organizations were in the house sometimes. They'd get the money, or the money would get written into a check and sent to that organization the next day if no one was there. So the idea was move from public discourse into action in a symbolic way, but also in a real way. For many of these organizations, $1,000 is not actually a small thing for a small not-for-profit doing the work they're doing. So it was, it, it was the stakes, right? The stakes were that decision which the dramaturgy had to sort of build up and help kind of accumulate over those minutes that we had together. Um, uh, next picture, please. Uh, so uh, also, like Big John Company, Louisiana State University brought us in because Sojourn had such a great time on this project that we wanted to keep exploring it. So we sort of just kind of put the word out a little bit, and Louisiana State University reached out to us, and uh, we ended up with a, the template of the show, which is a, a score and a structure of facilitation and an intentionality, as Morgan said earlier, that now goes and gets remade in locally specific ways, and we did it with LSU, and that is Jack who's a public defender in Baton Rouge, who in this moment is a cameo expert amidst the action of the show. There's four slots for cameo experts from community members during the show. He's being asked a very difficult question. He was awesome. You see a performer host up there who's asking him a question that comes from an audience card that was written anonymously earlier in the event of the show. Um, so as a result of kind of us figuring out this score in university settings, the show will open at its first regional theater in Portland this winter, Portland Playhouse, where we'll do like 22 performances and give away $22,000 in the Portland area. And then it goes straight to Montana to a performing arts center where we'll give away $5,000 over a few days. Uh, and then it's going to go probably to Vanderbilt University in Tennessee after that next year. So I am really interested right now as one part of Sojourn's work, not all of it, but one part of it, how are we building templates that have an aesthetic and engagement and process rigor, but also have the space to be uh, remade locally while maintaining their shape and while maintaining sort of the, the, the dramaturgy and intentionality that we bring to it. So there's portions of it that remain the same at every place, including the soundtrack, which is gorgeous, by a, a, a pretty big Chicago composer sound designer named Rick Sims. Uh, and there's a, a facilitation kind of track. But some of the material will get kind of made locally. My friend Nick Sly from New Orleans saw the, the Baton Rouge version back in February. And he's 
luckily not shouting something terrible about it. He's just nodding nicely, which is nice. It was very, that's right, talk to Nick after the session. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, that, and I'll just stop there. So that's how to end Power in 90 Minutes, and that's a project Sojourner's working on. So. so you guys should, yeah. Back up, and uh, uh, so we're going to, um, I think, open this up now. We have about... How much time do we have? I don't know. 20 minutes. We've got 20 minutes. So let's, uh, let's open it up for questions. Um, yes. Do we need, hold on, do we need mics here? Why don't you pass it back to me and I'll, I'll run around with this. Yeah. Hi, I, I have a question for Steve, and I'm interested to know whether the president who said you have my full support at the beginning is still saying the same thing after the work that you have been doing and whether that work has been in that president's kind of, whether, whether that president thought that was the direction you were going to take? Uh, I don't think she thought that was the direction I was going to take when she first hired me and brought me in there because I didn't know that it was the direction I was going to take. Uh, my vision and my own artistic belief systems, I think, have changed a lot. Um, this changed me even more. Uh, so, I, but I will say, when I got this grant from Arts Presenters and, and came to her and said, we have this large grant to look at Muslim <laughs> identity through the arts, she said, well, you know, six years ago, you told me you were going to do this. And I said, yeah, go do it, and kind of laughed. She said, but you're actually doing it. So she's very, she's very, very supportive of her faculty and her staff. And that's a gift that I have that I pray daily that she doesn't retire. <laughs> um, and so I think she's, a, she's a, been a great supporter, yes. What we tend, well, what, what we tend to say is, if you're having a conversation about an issue, um, who would you, who would normally come to your venue, your setting, just because they come, and who would you really want to be in the conversation to have it be uh, a surprising and tense and productive conversation. So, in the case of this project, we might say, well, we need to make sure there are people with lived experience of poverty, not just people who've read about it in the newspaper or never think about it. We need to make sure there are people who've worked around it and have expertise so that we're challenging stereotypes and assumptions. Am I, am I getting out what you're asking? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of interested in whether you would also like to see some extra people within you know, the, the particular sort of relationship that you see. Like, yeah, it's a great question. We, um, some projects we've done focus on those settings. Um, this one, we did invite them, but, but um, it, that, wasn't the, that wasn't the focus that the university was interested in, and it wasn't the focus we were interested in the first time, because the feeling was often when you get them in those settings at first, if you're not constructing it specifically to disarm them, you're dealing with their soundbite and their sort of uh, I'm on stage presence. So we were, we were a lot more interested in, no, the short answer is we didn't focus on them for this project. We did in Louisiana, and they were there, Congress people, city council people at LSU, and that was really interesting. It was a more intimate space. We won't in Portland. Uh, we probably will in Montana. It depends on the context, I think. So. If it's a university context, <laughs> if, it's a, if it's a university context, where it's student focused, students as the core ensemble. Yeah. Uh, and if it's a professional uh, regional theater as it is in Portland, it's sojourn cast. So it sort of depends on the venue and the interest. Okay. So. I'm not sure who's calling on people. When you say put the word out, like what does that mean practically? Put the word out. Like when you said you wanted 
When you said you wanted to sort of spread the word about the project, do you, uh, uh, did you target certain colleges? Did, oh. Are there places you had relationships with? Uh, I'm just actually just curious, it, literally, like what you sent them and how you were able to introduce the project. Yeah, it literally so far was like a Facebook posting uh, and like just saying to a couple friends at conferences, this is what's happening. We have not, we do not have the sort of infrastructure as we are to like do a push. So we've been sort of working on like, huh. And I mean, honestly, like it's one of the reasons that I talk about it here is because, ooh, maybe somebody will go, yeah, yeah, we should do that sometime. <laughs> So this, this is what I mean by putting the word out. Well, and I was, I was wondering, how are you, oh, hello. Um, are you, you, you said you were looking at creating this reproducible structure, or is this something you're originating yourself, or are you basing it on like uh, practitioners like Boal or Arvind Singhal and stuff like that? Like where, where, where is the structure? It's us, it's, it's us. us. I mean, certainly I'm, I'm influenced by Boal always just because he was a mentor, yeah. but like, no, it's, it's an original structure and an original dramaturgy. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, a lot of them come from his interests, but a lot of them also develop out of dialogue with, uh, with potential partners um, or organizations. Now, the, for instance, Cocktail, which was, we did at Louisiana State, that, was a, that, was, that project was generated by a collaboration with a biochemist playwright who is there, who we'd worked with many years before at the University of Minnesota. And they, di Ping and he dialogued about, it was kind of a, well, why don't we do a project about science? It, was, it started there. And they talked about that, uh, about various things. He, uh, Vince Licata, who was that uh, playwright, he wanted to get real science on stage, which he felt wasn't really done. Uh, but Ping is actually not a very science guy. Uh, he wanted to get real humanity uh, on stage. He wanted to, that. So they found a, a, a story that they could both do. Because within the text and within the projection score, there's actual chemistry being discussed the mechanisms by which you combine drugs and to make, to, to make pills, basically. So it comes from a lot of different ways. Like, um, but mostly, I'd, I'd say, we, can't, we never do anything that doesn't um, excite us creatively. The Ping Chong Company is an arts organization first and foremost. Our work is intended to, um, is intended to, you know, we want our work to have social impact, um, but, but we as artists, we have to be jazzed by the subject and the circumstance to do it. So that's how, that's how it's done. I, I just think that teases out this really important conversation about universities and ensembles, and particularly sort of what are the values and intentionality of ensemble, where it's experimentation, social change, community impact, and sort of like, I think sometimes mushy sense of ensemble pushes students away when they first arrive at school, and it is sort of an example, for instance, of Ping Chong and Company and the breadth of their work and the breadth of sort of aesthetics amidst a very clear purpose that I think is really useful in university contexts to help. And there are other companies represented in this room that are that as well, but that are necessary. Otherwise, I just feel like people think they have to make a choice in a way. Oh, if I'm doing ensemble, I guess it's these values that I heard about over there, or it's, it's this kind of avant-garde thing that I heard about over there. Like, how are we really giving them access to their own purpose and practices that are really flexible?
So the question is, um, why did the Congo come up in two different instances, and how did that relationship happen in, at Kent State University? doing a work on, on the Congo um, for a long time. And the, the, he read a book uh, about Cambodia. Mm. Yes. Philip, um, uh, oh, I feel terrible. There's a very famous book about um, the genesis. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah. Someone say it out loud. Yeah, Philip Corbett. What's the book called? Too Much. I think it's too, we, we don't. It's a video for tele, a video for, for people who's, I, I can't people remember. People who know t too much of Cambodia, or it's part of my documentary yep. film. We'll find uh, it. <laughs> the part we cut out. And then out. I just, the part <laughs> I cut out. Um, and then also Adam Hodge Shields, um, the Leopold, the sec, about the book on Le Leopold II. Yes. Um, and 2004, as you know, the 10th anniversary of the genocide of Rwanda, and uh, that uh, you know that the, all the Hutu were you know fleeing the country Rwanda to the Congo, and it's just we don't have the you know the divisions we created. Am I right there? If you go there, um, we have uh, no divisions so just people in and out and then the chaos continues and then we are benefiting from that that uh, that interest um, in the Congo was uh, the primary I think the reason why pain wanted to do a uh, work and then why can state uh, I the director at that time and then also Ro Green um, talked about the possibility of uh, who is uh, going to be the first director series, an artist in residence, and then they chose Pinchon. And for, uh, in terms of the continuation, um, that was, uh, the opportunity came uh, at Syracuse University, actually because we'd been at Syracuse Stage, which is connected to Syracuse University, before working there. Tim Bond, another longtime collaborator and friend. Um, and because uh, Nancy Cantor and that program knew our work when this community, this was really the, the desire to heal the Congolese community, to work for them to work together and to create a uh, a vehicle for which they could reach out to other communities, because these are literally people who in, uh, in, the, in the Congo might have been, might have been um, uh, killing each other from different tribal and ethnic affiliations. But the wanting, the desire to get beyond that was, was that was there. That was their thing, and I give all props to them. And we were just asked to come in and be a vehicle for making, giving them a tool to use that. And they have been doing that. And you know, it's, it's the tools, and what Michael's talking about, tool, the, the ending the poverty is a tool. You know, and that is how, that's kind of how we approach it too. To inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families. Uh, okay. Stories yeah, from yeah. Rwanda. Yeah. Good book. And then, the, and then and working with, uh, uh, and then the, of course the, the one of the major sources was around was uh, King Leopold's ghost, and um, and I think also what I, I should say that the, the blindness was about both the colonial exploitation. And we focused it on that period partially because the campus, the, the community in, there wasn't like a lot of uh, liberal arts college, arts programs, it's not the most diverse, it was not the least diverse, <laughs> I promise you, but it wasn't the most diverse. So we focused it on the, on the colonial thing, 
but also on the, there's another part of that, which is the rise of the human rights movement that led to the, to the, to the really the taking away the Congo from under the private, the private, it was, you know, the Congo colony was, was King Leopold's private bank, and he just exploited the people viciously. Was, could I ask Stephen a question? Sure. Is that a, um, I, I feel like the conversation that started earlier today about ensemble and the meaning of it, I feel like you might have this just really interesting experience of it because you said that your background is musical theater and actually an image of Chorus Line posted up there. I don't know if that's a show you were, okay. So I think, I think a lot of people sort of, I, I, don't know my, I don't know my Chorus Line well enough, I apologize. Um, I think a lot of people would say, oh, theater, ensemble, chorus line, what a great sort of example of the kind of original company idea when it first kind of, in a meta way, became a part of the storytelling landscape of American theater. And now you've, you've moved into creating this amazing, complex, uh, diverse ensemble uh, and sort of set of practices. So I wonder for you, in terms of your journey from one kind of ensemble experience to the one you're in now, how do you think about the idea of ensemble and, and what it means to you? That's, that's a very good question and correlation. And I would say that a lot of what working with Mr. Bennett's work, Michael Bennett, Michael Bennett's line. work, yeah. um, was able to do because he, he brought a bunch of dancers into a room and said, tell me a story. And then he took those stories and they molded them and they put them together. Are you one of those original dancers? I'm not. Okay. Okay. I'm okay. not quite that old. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just didn't want to not know that if that was the Thank case. You. Yeah. Um, okay. It was interesting though, and I'll quickly with that is that a lot of those original dancers ended up being in Bob Fosse's Chicago and not being in Michael Bennett's chorus line because they wanted the sure bet of the job um, instead of this, doing the workshop for the performance. But it was it was a, a way of working with the public theater to have the space to develop a work and create that ensemble that became a, an amazing story about really adolescence and, and life and change and growing up and the passion of what you want to do for the rest of your life. And all that stuff feels connected to the kids you showed us on and, here. And it is very much connected to that. And I think the, um, the ability to be able to put it together in story and have that story go out. However you're going to put it all together, and I was even saying this yesterday with Liz Lerman and some of the people, I struggled identifying myself as an artist for many, many years because I was raised as a singer, did an undergraduate work in theater and, uh, and graduate work in dance. So am I an actor? Am I a singer? Am I a dancer? What am I? And I became, to, in my eyes, a performer. And I see young artists today, don't label me, do not label me, do not make me be an actor, do not make me be a dancer. Uh, and so I think the idea of what um, is being created is an idea that we train the body with skills uh, and then get, let the story come out. And I think the same thing is true with form, with the form that you're talking about, the form that we used as far as volunteering and, and the system and letting that come out and, into a story is, amazing to me and Judith Molina yesterday God what an amazing time that was said first discover what it is you want to say and then discover how you want to say it and I think if we try and force a story into a model which I'll tell you quickly working with Max with um, Theater of the Press NYC right now I we forced this idea on on Theater of the Press about Muslim identity but then didn't have the people in the room to tell the story correctly right there. But an amazing story has started to come out that does identify it by trusting the process, letting it all happen, and it, at the same time, um, letting that ensemble take care of itself. And so it got, it, it's messy, and it comes through, and I'm saying, well, I gotta have the funders. They gotta know it's gotta be about Muslim identity and all this. So, so what does ensemble mean to you now, working with these students? Ensemble to me means a group of people getting together uh, and f saying, what do you want to say? And then let's look at it. Do we have any musicians in the room that want to do it this way? Do we have dancers in the room that want to tell the story this way? Do we have other people in the room 
that want to write about it and tell about it. And then how do we bring that message out? And on top of that, then, it, it's a way to, for me that's important to facilitate dialogue in the community because that continues the ensemble. The ensemble then becomes the community that you're speaking with. And I think that's a major part that I consider a big part of my work. So nice you guys found each other. I mean, that sounds like a great partnership. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's been a great partnership. And uh, we're going to, and uh, it's going to continue. Uh, and uh, it's hopefully, only just begun. Some, we have some other mm -hmm. things that we're talking about for down the road as well. So, um, but, and it was, I know personally, for, for, for me and for Ping, um, being able to partner in Queens was um, very important because Manhattan isn't what the city that he grew up in, and it isn't the city that I came to 30 years ago. It's this, and this building was just beautiful, but all around us is this luxury, and it's growing up and up and up, and the community that we had, that kind of the Judith so, so spoke so much about, that isn't here anymore. The East Village, there's some remnants of it. Yes, it isn't here, but it is in Queens. And that means a lot. I guess I'm very, very lucky to be right in the middle of that. And I just can't say what I get to do and the people I get to be exposed to on a daily basis and how that informs my own work and how I get to facilitate other people's work because of it. Great, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt there just because we're at time. However, um, I'm sure you all have some more questions. Please keep the conversations going. I don't know how you guys feel if you want any closing remarks or anything, but we are at time just, just so we're aware. No, I, uh, I wanna give a shout out to Christine Barr who, uh, for helping us in Ping Chong Company. I wanna give a shout out to our sound man. Thank you. That's all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you.